So, um, hello everyone. Uh, hello. Good, good afternoon. Uh, in Toronto. In Toronto. If you could please mute yourself. I, I, I apologize. Um, um, so, good afternoon to everyone, Eastern Coast uh, wise. Good evening for those of us join. Uh, those of you who are joining us from uh, Israel. Um, my name is Ari Dubnov. I'm directing Jude uh, the program for Judaic Studies at the George Washington University, but uh, together with Professor Orian Zakai, also from GW, and my colleague, esteemed colleague Neta Stahl uh, from John Hopkins University, we are the co-conspirators of a, uh, a group that we've called uh, Hebrew Lit Lab, Hebrew Literature uh, Laboratory, um, and we're not doing any uh, science experiments, but we are providing Providing hopefully a space to discuss uh, Hebrew literature um, in this part of the diaspora. Uh, and it's really my, my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this very unique special event. Uh, we had to roll the virtual red carpet for such a stellar group of uh, authors and scholars who are gathered here together uh, today to discuss um, 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 Neta's new, uh, 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 new book. Uh, and we're entering into a, a very ungodly age. So it will be interesting to think about the divine uh, through uh, Neta's interpretation of, of Hebrew literature. So the way we will proceed is as following. We will uh, start with a short presentation of about 10 minutes or so by Neta herself, after which um, I will pass on the virtual microphone to um, the, uh, uh, our panelists. And I think that it, for the sake of um, uh, simplicity, I will introduce each uh, of the speakers just before uh, they will uh, 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 um, start their um, 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 their presentation. So uh, without further ado, I will, um, Neta, I'm, I'm passing the baton to you. Um, so thank you. Um, and I, of course, would like to first wholeheartedly thank Sidra uh, Dekov and Ezrahi, Lilach Lachman, Shachar Pinsker, and Chaviva Pedaya for honoring my book by joining us to share their perspective on it today. Um, so in 1906, Yosef Chaim Brenner wrote the following line. We write Hebrew because we cannot live without it, because the divine spark which is within us emerges only with this flame, because this sparkle does not burn, does not fulfill in its entirety, but in this language. This is the same Brenner who asserted uh, about four years afterwards that he could not understand those who search and long for a certain fiction, a fiction by all means, which is called God. The paradox of a literature that emerged as part of a cultural and national revolution against traditional Judaism and its divinity, yet in whose letters God is very much present, is where my book begins. Admittedly, I'm not the first to point it out. And in so doing, I join many other, sc other scholars. Some of them are here today with us, who in recent decades have tried to show that despite its stated secularism, Zionism never really succeeded in releasing itself from its theological heritage. In his book, Bekoach HaEl, With the Power of God, Hanan and Hever suggest that already at the beginning of the 20th century, there are obvious signs of attempts on the part of the Hebrew writers to form a national theology, that is to create a nationality by relying on political assumptions with theological foundations. As Hamutad Samir showed in this very forum a few months ago and in her wonderful book, Bialik work reflect, reflects the desire to give birth to a secular nation against and via its theological foundations. My book, though, tries to do something a little bit different. Instead of framing my discussion exclusively around political theology and focusing on the ways in which the theological colors the secular and vice versa, I focus on the nature of the divinity that emerges in these books and the ideological, cultural, and political trends that, that allowed it. Furthermore, 
I'm less interested in what Shraga Baron defined as a religious mode of searching for God. Although the story that I tell begins with this search, it focuses on the God that modern Hebrew writers found. The contemporary Hebrew poet Admiel Kosman, with what might look like an affirmation of the end of the affirmation search, titled, titled one of his poetry books, after one of its poems, we arrived at God, Iganu Le'eloi. But the poem demonstrates that this arrival does not define the nature of this God, and in fact, does not end the search for what this God means. Furthermore, as I try to demonstrate, for many of these writers, the search itself is not for God, but for God's metaphysical nature. Perhaps more important for me in this book is to examine the way modern Hebrew writers seek and often find creative ways to use traditional narratological and poetic expression in order to represent the divine in their works. Kosman, in the poem that I've just mentioned, echoes and perhaps even responds to an early 1930s poem by the Hebrew poet Shin Shalom titled Betzela Ein, in the shadow of the nothingness. Like Kosman, Shin Shalom describes a journey in the first person plural, but while Kosman tells of a journey downhill in which the encounter with God is accidental and meaningless, his predecessor describes a journey uphill, a journey which is meant to find our God in heaven, as he says. Shin Shalom's poem may look at first to be describing a search for the divine which ends with nothingness, with Ein, but a closer reading reveals that the poet in fact alludes here to the Hasidic notion of the world as expressing the fullness of the infinite. The poem indeed depicts a much more nuanced journey, one that seems to celebrate Zionist pioneering as a reunification with the divine. This reunification is possible thanks to the dveikut of the searchers and the pantheistic nature of the God they find. A pantheistic divinity can be found in both early and more recent modern Hebrew literature. But this affinity for the God of nature derives from very different theological and political, poetical aspirations. As I show in the first chapter of my book, Pantheism was embraced by fin de Sile modern Hebrew writers as linking the nationalist enterprise and the divine, while at the same time offering nature, sometimes specifically the nature in the land of Israel, as the space in which the God of the national Jew dwells. Furthermore, pantheism was often presented as conflicting with monotheism, and therefore with traditional Judaism. At the same time, Pantheistic ideas are prevalent in Kabbalistic and Hasidic literature, and this allowed early modern Hebrew writers to associate their God and their literature with a tradition of Jewish literature that offered a radical change in mainstream Judaism. Pantheism, whether rhetorical as in Achad Ha'am, or more theologically authentic as in Berdichevsky, is central in this initial period of the formation of a national Hebrew literature. But as mentioned above, pantheism is also prevalent now in the first decade of the 21st century. So Hebrew literature in this regard may have come a full circle. However, as I show in my epilogue, here we find a different interpretation and integration of a Kabbalistic and Hasidic notions of the divine. Since at the center of my epilogue stands the poetry of Chaviva Pedaya and also of Amog Behar, I will leave it to Chaviva to expand on it. I would just say that one important theme which is unique to her poetry is that in expressing yearning for a pantheistic divinity that is both corporal and incorporal, she arrives, to borrow Kosman's metaphor again, at what I call comforting pantheism. This is important because surprisingly what I found while working on this book is that the idea of comforting divinity which one can fully merge with and find solace in is the rare theme throughout most of the modern Hebrew literature of the 20th century. Even in Yona Volach's poetry, where one can find a merging, perhaps subordination of the physical to the metaphysical, there is almost never realization of this 
merging into a full and peaceful sensation of God. The closest she gets is to miss the sweet voice of God and to lament his disappearance. This brings me to a theme that I did find, perhaps not surprisingly, to be prevalent in modern Hebrew literature throughout the 20th century, that of anti-theodicy. The Odyssey, namely the justification of God in the face of personal or collective suffering and the negation of this justification in the form of anti-theodicy can be found in Agnon's works with his narration of negative theology and in Atzag's poetry through his parodied rhyming in Anacreonal Cotevate Zavon, as well as in his use of the concept of Esther Panim in Streets of the River. It can also be found in the poetry of Vigdor Meiri, Avram Khalfi, and Yehuda Michai. I deal with the Odyssey and anti theodicy in my chapters on Atzag and Agnon, but I also dedicate a chapter to this notion in the context of Israeli anti-war poetry and the question of God's responsibility for the horrors of war. This chapter begins with a discussion of Meiri's poetry, but its main focus is two later poets, Yehuda Michai and Dalia Rabikovich. I argue that in both Amichai's and Ravikovich's poet, poetic response to war, a divine promise as, uh, plays an important role as part of the poetic mission of the poet. However, while in Amichai's war poetry, God is often blamed for breaching his promise of divine compassion to humanity, in many of Ravikovich's poems, the political, the, the political and military leaders are to blame for exploiting the notion of a chosen people and the divine promise for glorious victory to justify war and its costs. I show that these two poets who wrote around the same time and were associated with the same poetic circle present two quite different models of anti-war poetry in general and of the role of God and men in it in particular. As I hope this brief introduction has allowed you to see, what I'm trying to do in this book is to expose general tendencies and approaches of literary representations of God in modern Hebrew literature. What I do not aim to do is either to provide a mapping of the divine in this corpus or to write, to write its complete history. Left aside of my discussion or mentioned only in passing are some prominent figures like Zelda and Leah Goldberg. The first, because I did not have anything new to add to the rich scholarly discussion on her God. And the later, because my own contribution to the discussion came to fruition too late for it to be included in this book. I also do not deal in this book with the rich poetry that appeared in Meshiva Ruach, a literary journal which since 1994 has served as the main platform for poetic expression of the second and third generation of Gushemonim. I could justify this omission based on the gap between my and these poets' ideological and political worldviews. But after years of working on a Tzab's poetry, that might not be too convincing. So I consider it as one of more, one more missing chapter in a story of a divinity and a literature that I'm really glad that uh, you're all, we are all interested to hear about today. Indeed, following a week in which the ghosts of the past once again have threatened to eclipse our future, we can use a divine intervention or at least intermission of some sort. So let us now move on to the better part of this event. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Neta, for this um, uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And I also for the, um, I, I shared using the chat uh, box uh, the link to uh, the website where one can purchase uh, the copy of, of the book, The Divine in Modern Hebrew Literature. Um, so uh, we will switch now to our uh, first commentator, uh, Sidra de Koveni Zrahi, who is a professor emerita of general and comparative literature at, uh, uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She has written on subject raising from representations of the Holocaust in post-war Israel, the European and American culture to the configurations of exile and diasporic uh, compensations in classical, pre-modern and contemporary Jewish literature. 
uh, among her numerous books, uh, I can count by words alone, the Holocaust and literature that came out uh, with University of Chicago Press in 1980, uh, Booking Passage, Exile and Homecoming in Modern Jewish Imagination uh, from University of California uh, Press in 2000 that I uh, personally uh, am teaching some, some uh, parts from it that I'm assigning my students um, and two books in Hebrew, um, uh, in 2007, Bekoven Azachi became the Guggenheim Fellow for her project on Jerusalem, which was just published as Figuring Jerusalem, Politics and the Poetics of the Sacred Center, University of Chicago Press 2022, so Mazel Tov. Um, and in November uh, uh, 2019, she was awarded an honorary doctorate in Jerusalem from the Hebrew Union College, uh, Jewish Institute of uh, Religion. Um, so Sidra, I, um, I'm moving you uh, uh, um, uh, virtually to the center of the floor and, and, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you, Netta, for writing this book and thank you, Arya, for your, for your words of introduction and thanks everybody who's come uh, to, to join us on this um, moment. Um, אל מלא רחמים, אל מלא האל מלא רחמים, היו הרחמים בעולם ולא רק בו. God full of mercy. If God were not so full of mercy, there would be mercy in the world and not just in him. Before I begin to respond to Netta's inspiring book, I have, in the immortal words of Yudha Michai, invoked the divine who regardless of our beliefs remains our ultimate address in dire times. El Male Rachamim, please intervene on behalf of the Ukrainian people who are fighting so valiantly for their lives and freedom. And if you cannot intervene, then please God move over to make space for mercy in the world. In the few minutes at my disposal, I want to look first at the premise of this book, it's a short book with a large premise. And then to relate briefly to two of the Hebrew writers who are central to Netta's world and to mine as well, Shai Agnon and Yudha Michai. Netta's book opens with two quotes, one from Isaiah, to whom then will you liken God and what likeness will you compare unto him? That's from Isaiah 40, 40 18. And one from the Hebrew writer and literary entrepreneur Yudchet Brenner from 1906, which Netta has already quoted. We write in Hebrew because we cannot live without it, because the divine spark which is within us emerges only with this flame, because this spark does not burn, does not fulfill in its entirety, but in this language. Brenner's divine spark, Hanitzot Elohi, will, as we all know, morph into Sholem's apocalyptic thorn in the letter he wrote to Rosenzweig two decades later in 1926. So right from the beginning, we understand the conundrum. The title of Netta's book itself implies a number of interesting questions. The divine in modern Hebrew literature. To some, it will seem a tautology. If we take out the word modern and look at the title, the divine in Hebrew literature, our response might be, that the divine is the ultimate interlocutor in Hebrew literature from the Bible to this day. Of course, there are many permutations of the divine human dialogue and sometimes surrogates for the divine. As for example, in modern Israeli Akedah poems where the army or the government substitutes for the divine authority. One could say that even when the divine is explicitly rejected, the very absence is a marker of presence. The ventriloquizing of the divine voice has been central to the entire Jewish project. It is manifest in the Hebrew Bible and Midrash, in Piyut from the fifth century to the present, in the Zohar and Hasidic narrative, and even in Masculic literature. So from our vantage point in the second decade of the 21st century, and as we look back at more than a century of modern Hebrew literature, we might ask, what is new in manifestations of or references to the divine in modern Hebrew literature? First, we must acknowledge, as Netta does right from the beginning, that the Muskilic project and Zionism as its political and cultural product was androcentric and meant to feature the human or secular dimension of individual 
and collective Jewish life. But on the other hand, the very thing that Sholem warned us against in embracing that project, and that Bialik actually demonstrated in his own prose and poetry, i.e. the apocalyptic thorn that would come back to prick us eventually, has indeed returned in the form of messianic movements that have entered the political realm in our time. But what I wanna do in the few minutes left is to focus not so much on the more general theological or political question as it works its way through modern Israeli culture, especially after 1967. But on what is, I think, central to Netta's book, sometimes explicitly and sometimes implicitly, the implications of the specific mandate of the writer of fiction or poetry or drama, which is inherently different from that of the politician, philosopher, theologian, or scholar of sacred texts. Allow me to put the question a bit crassly. What is God doing or not doing as a character or a reference in the poetry and prose considered by Netta in her evocative book? Or put another way, is it really legitimate to consider the theological dimensions or references in any modern Hebrew poem, story, or drama? Perhaps we can appreciate the questions raised here and the material offered if we turn the lens a bit and consider that all voices in the poetry and fiction Netta is considering are just that, voices ventriloquized in some explicit or implicit conversation. That insight can, I believe, be extended to a dialogical reading of poetry with a nod to Bakhtin, or at least that of dialogical poets like Amichai. Even God or the divine can then become one voice among many. What I would say about most of the writers Netta cites working within the millennial tradition of Hebrew literature is what American Jewish writer Grace Paley quoted from her father, the atheist, in one of her later stories. Why do you bring up God so much, she asks. God is very good for conversation, he responds. Here is the best example of that in modern Hebrew literature, the opening of Agnon's Agunot, which Netta quotes and analyzes beautifully. I suspect that many of you know this passage almost by heart. God is described as weaving a talit that is whole. And it's almost sacrilege to read this in English, but I will in this, for the sake of time. It is said, a thread of grace is spun and drawn out of the deeds of Israel. And the Holy One, blessed be he himself in his glory, sits and weaves strand on strand, a talit all grace and all mercy, for the congregation of Israel to deck herself in. Radiant in the light of her beauty, she glows, even in these, the lands of her exile, as she did in her youth, in her father's house, in the temple of her sovereign and the city of sovereignty, Jerusalem. And then, as is almost inevitable in Agnon's fictional universe, the talit unravels because of the deeds of humankind. Some hindrance creeps up and snaps a thread in the loom. Then the talit is damaged. Evil spirits hover about it, enter into it, and tear it to shreds. At once a sense of shame assails all Israel, and they know they are naked. Their days of rest are wrested from them. Their feasts are fasts. Their lot is dust instead of luster. I think that's a great translation, by the way. <clears throat> Although scholars worked hard to find the proof text for this so-called quote and concluded finally that it is Agnon's invention, I think many of them are looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place. We might recall that the Rambam's lasting contribution to our discussion as Netta stresses is his embrace of biblical anthropomorphism, of the Bible speaking Bilishon B'nai Adam. But rather than look for the source of the quote from Agunot, it is crucial, I submit, to distinguish between the religious and the literary imagination. And this has to do with a place of authority or authority. Netta says that God's action, actions reveal him to be the author of his story. I would suggest a slight amendment that even here where, as Netta writes, God moves the plot based on the character's actions, still God is a character and the talit is a template or symbol of perfection in the heavenly and temporarily in the earthly spheres. The other characters and prime movers in this story are the earthly actors, 
the narrator, Ben Uri, Dina, and most importantly, the rabbi. God is a character in this story then, but not necessarily the reigning consciousness. And there is a tikkun, a repair in the story, but it is not attributed to the divine. It comes from the rabbi who has committed a sin by marrying two people who don't belong together. The rabbi who then goes out in the world agunot, to repair the plight of star-crossed lovers. Netta goes on to demonstrate how the theodicy implied in this early story will unravel in Agnon's later stories and human deeds and misdeeds will become the driving force in the universe. There are miracles, of course, in some of Agnon's stories like Bilvav Yamim, but not in others, most notably Tmol Shilshom. But let's go back to the famous Talit at the beginning of Agunot and fast forward to the end of the 20th century to compare it to Amichai's Talit, or as Hannah Bloch and Hannah Kronfeld call it, Talis, from his last book of poetry. That sacred object, not confined to the synagogue or even to a time of day, as it morphs into a towel, a parachute, a butterfly emerging from a cocoon, a wedding canopy. Most of you know that poem. Not only is this talus not in danger of being worn and cast aside, but the poetic voice rejects the very binaries of the whole and the torn or religious and secular for that matter. Here, I would suggest carrying Netta's argument one step farther. I refer in my own work to Amichai as Paitan Shel Hayom Yom, or poet of the sacred quotidian. And I would bring him together with Chaviva Pedaya's beautiful poem in which, as Netta writes, she incorporates God into one's daily routine. And I'm just reading a bit of the English uh, translation. He who whispers in the cars in the midst of the intercity roads. This I submit is the same God who manifests himself in Amichai's famous image of the woman taking something out of the refrigerator, illuminated from the inside by a light from another world. What is crucial here, of course, is that it is the woman whom the speaker is observing, illuminated in the dailiness of her life, not in some ascetic encounter between self and divine other. Again, what I think we are looking for in all these wonderful texts that Netta brings is not a theological center or a dialectic between sacred and secular, but rather the different voices or sensibilities, sacred objects and sacred language, not confined to sacred space or time. Indeed, we can find resonances of Amichai's embrace in Chaviva Padaya's and in Almog Behar's writing. And as Amichai says, with the same body that stoops to pick up a fallen something from the floor, I bow, I bow down to God. That is my faith, my religion. So the final question to which Netta gives us rich answers is not, does Agnon or Amichai or Avikovich or even Behar or Padaya believe in God, but do their characters? Or how do the characters in the stories or the speakers in the poetry articulate their faith, their struggle with theodicy and with life on earth? Allow me then to conclude where I started by invoking God's mercy on this poor planet, threatened by the dire consequences of climate change, by plague, by war, and now by threats of nuclear destruction. Sometimes it seems that it's really time for God to start over again, as he did when he brought the flood upon the earth. But wait, you say, the children, Jonathan, Alma, and Daniel, Netta's children, and all our children and grandchildren. No, no, please, God, no more floods. Thank you so much, Netta, for giving us an opportunity to think about and talk about this wonderful book. <clears throat> wonderful. Thank you so much, Sidra. And I'm moving uh, right to our next speaker, uh, Professor Shachar Pinsker, who's a professor of Judaic studies and Middle East studies and associate di director of the Frankel Center for Judaic studies at the University of Michigan. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Jewish Research. His scholarly writings include two award-winning books, 
Literary Passports, the Making of Modernist Hebrew Fiction in Europe from 2011, and A Rich Brew, How Cafes Created Modern Jewish Culture from 2018. He's also the editor with uh, Sheila Jelen of Hebrew Gender and Modernity from 2007, Women's Hebrew Poetry on American Shores from 2016, and Where the Sky and the Sea Meet, Israeli Yiddish Stories, which is forthcoming. He's currently writing a book on Yiddish in Israeli literature and co-directing an NEH-supported research project entitled uh, Filiton, the Public Sphere, and Modern Jewish uh, Cultures. Uh, so, Shahra, floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay, I was disconnected for a second, but I, I'm glad that I am back. And... Um, yes, yeah, so I want to start by, by thanking Neta uh, Stahl and Arik Dubnov uh, for, for the introduction and uh, even more so for inviting me uh, to this very exciting event and I'm really glad to be in the presence of such distinguished scholars and, and colleagues to launch uh, uh, Neta's wonderful book. I have to say that I'm especially grateful for the opportunity to delve back into questions and topics that I studied and wrote about about 10 years ago. And since then, my research has taken me on different paths, but both the questions and the text that Netta's book deal with are still very close to my heart. So it was a real pleasure uh, to, read, um, to read this book and to think about the many questions that uh, it raises, not to speak about uh, the wonderful um, analysis of so many rich texts. So the book is really comprehensive. It's thought-provoking and elegant, uh, and it's devoted, as we heard, to the per pervasive presence of God in modern Hebrew literature. It explores the qualities that poets and prose writers from the later 19th century to the early decades of the 21st century attributed to the divine. It's just 200 beautifully written pages Netta manages to give us an incredible panoramic and multi-layered analysis of the strategies, the text, the themes that dominated Hebrew literature and its ongoing attempt to represent the divine in the face of many challenges, some of them we heard about from Sidra, many historical challenges, metaphysical, theological, and representational. My comments in the next few minutes will focus on the first two chapters of uh, the book. So I'm going to move a little bit away from Agnon and Amichai that Sidra uh, uh, spoke about to deal with Hebrew writing about God during the fin de siècle and the early decades of the 20th century. And of course, this takes us mostly into Eastern Europe, to the Russian Empire and to the Pale of Settlement and the tumultuous event in places like Odessa, Kiev, Lviv, Lemberg, Gomel, Zhitomir, Mejibej, uh, where Hebrew writers were born and write. And these places are on, on, on our mind now, of course, as the residents became once again victims of war that did not want, and many of them uh, are becoming refugees who are forced to flee to other places, like many of the Hebrew writers that Neta um, is writing about. So I will say just a few words about, uh, about Neta's penetrating analysis of texts by writers such as uh, Shalom Yaakov Abramovich, Chad Ha'am, uh, Micha Yosef Berdichevsky, Bialik, Yosef Chaim Brenner, and Avraham Shlonsky, but I actually want to start with Gershom Sholem, who Sidra also uh, mentioned, who was of course not a Hebrew poet or writer, but the most important scholar of Jewish mysticism. In the introduction to the book, Netta quotes and briefly discusses the famous letter to Franz Rosenzweig from 1926, in which Sholem was warning of the blindness of modern Hebrew speakers to the act of suppressing the sacred language by its actualization. Uh, Sholem likened the speakers of modern Hebrew language to blind people walking on the edge of the abyss, ignoring the sacredness of the language with their e the eagerness to turn Hebrew into a vernacular language and by doing so stripping it of its religious features. 
So this is very famous and many people have written about it. Sidra also alluded uh, 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 to this, but I want to remind us also uh, that uh, although Sholem rarely wrote about Hebrew literature, in a le late lecture he gave later in life in, in 1970, he said, and I'm quoting, what the value and worth of language will be, the language from which God will have withdrawn is the question, the question which must be posed by those who still believe that they can hear the echo of the vanished world of creation in the imminence of the world. This is the question to which in our time only the poets presumably have the answer." End of quote. So I want to suggest that what Sholem hinted uh, at is the fact that the arena that wrestled the most with the questions of God and the divine is modern Hebrew and Jewish uh, uh, writers and poets. Um, those, those people who explore the dialectics inherent in the uh, permeable boundaries between everyday language and poetry in Hebrew and in Yiddish and other uh, uh, language, but especially maybe in Hebrew, and between the secular and the religious, and I put this in, in, in quotes, and I actually want to, um, to say something that I think that in fact, one of the most important arguments of Netta's book is to go against the simplicity dichotomy between the religious and the secular in terms of, uh, in terms of literature and, and maybe Bichlal in general. In the introduction to the book, Netta laments the fact that many scholars st still take at face value the assumption that modern Hebrew literature is a secular phenomenon, and even that what makes modern Hebrew literature modern as opposed to the old literature is that secular secularity or secularism. Categories such as secular and religious, she writes correctly, still dominate even the recent discussion. And I want to, to quote here from the introduction to, to the book, what Netta writes, the problem for a book about the representation of God in modern Hebrew literature is that such categories, uh, uh, as such as religious and secular, assume various meanings re regarding what they actually mean. For the sake of understanding the representation of the divine in modern Hebrew literature, to argue that a work is religious or secular is unproductive. Indeed, if the definition of religion or religious is so amorphous, it is hard to see how it could be helpful. And in a case, relying on it would probably limit rather than enrich our discussion. At the same time, Netta recognizes that the historical context in which Hebrew literature was created, especially what she discusses in the first and second uh, uh, chapters, which is the end of the 19th century, beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century, was a time of the collapse of traditional structures of Jewish society and the emergence of new uh, uh, paradigm. How does one solve this kind of problem? Netta writes in the introduction, I will analyze the representation of God without allowing the opposition with, between secular and religious to dominate it. This will allow us to consider some of the, the trends that characterize this literature, including both trends that are associated with traditional Judaism and trends that go against it without having to classify them as belonging to one side or the other of this dichotomy and while taking into account that this binary might have been in the, in the background of, and indeed many have influenced these works. I think this is a brilliant move that actually opens the way to a truly original reading and analysis of text. Some of them, I want to remind you, are very familiar to scholars of Hebrew uh, literature, poems of, of uh, Bialik, uh, novels and stories of Mendele Mochersforim, Abramovich, of, of Berdichevsky, um, and, and, but this move enables Netta to turn her attention to these writers and do these texts and identify very clearly uh, a move towards new ways of dealing with God and representing uh, uh, God. As when she talks about uh, Findi Siekle, uh, she speak about pantheism and the way in which modern Hebrew writers and thinkers represent God as integral part of nature. 
She shows, for example, that in Had Am's essay, in Abramovich's stories such as Shem, Shem and Yafet on the Train, a novel such as Sefer Kapsanim, The Book of Beggars, in Berdichevsky's stories, and in many of Bialik's poem, there is a focus on God not only or not primarily in the Beit Midrash or in traditional religious texts, but in the world of nature. In order to explain this shift, Neta emphasizes Jewish nationalism and Zionism. Um, she writes, in order to make God an internal part of Jewish nationalism, writer are e writers are eager to release him from his traditional image, which is often depicted in terms of non pantheistic divinity. So while I found this analysis and reading as pointing to the centrality of pantheism and God in nature really correct and very convincing, both in general and in the, uh, in the, in the reading of, of many texts, beautiful readings of, of, of text, I, I want to raise the question about the place of Zionism and nationalism and think that maybe Zionism and the whole, uh, um, the whole question of political theology, which she, she writes about and discuss, was very much part of the historical picture and was a, a very important factor for, for, for figures like Ahad Am, but maybe much less so for the other. I think that more than anything else, as Netta claims in the second chapter, it was really the influence of figures such as Friedrich Nietzsche's radical ideas and the ways that they were read and understood in the Russian and German literary and cultural milieu, both Jewish and non-Jewish, um, in the context of decadence, Russian symbolism of the Silver Age, as well as early expressionism that brought this change in understanding and representing uh, uh, the divine. So while I think we, we really need to read uh, Bialik and Mendele and Berdichevsky in the historical Jewish context of the transition from the Haskala into um, new trends and new political ideologies such as Zionism, uh, when we read the actual poetry and, and literature, it's much more important to, to, to read it in the context of the Russian and German and European literature that was written in the time in which they are uh, participating. This, only, this is even more true uh, in the second chapter where Netta turns to the concept of what she calls theomorphism, the idea that humans can take on the qualities of the divine. Uh, and she does this in order to read and reread novels and stories by Yosef Chaim Brenner and Avraham Shlonsky, two very different writers who nevertheless shared preoccupation, almost obsession with the divine. Netta shows beautifully that both Brenner and Shlonsky share a similar desire compensate for the sense of God's absence by stressing man's the theomorphic qualities, but they do it for very different purposes, as she shows. For Brenner, the comparison, the comparison is meant to point at the helplessness of divinity and of humanity, whereas Shlonsky theomorphism uh, in, in many of his poems is aimed at elevating both man and God. And of course, here we are firmly within the sphere of Hebrew modernism that flourished mostly in Europe. And then later, when people like Shlonsky and uh, Brenner immigrated to Palestine in the early decades of the 20th century. So as I tried to show in my book, Literary Passport, the common notion that Hebrew modernism is completely devoid of religious, mystical preoccupation is mistaken. In fact, figures such as Brenner, and not only Brenner, uh, people like Uri Nissan Gnesin, Gershon Schofman, and so many others, who in the midst of the crisis of traditional Jewish institution and the so-called revival of modern and presumably secular Hebrew culture, expressed a strong desire and commitment to maybe not so much religious belief, but to religious search. And Brenner, who is sometimes described as one of the founding father of secular Hebrew Zionist culture, was in fact the figure who brought into Hebrew literature and culture 
the idea that religiosity should not require adherence to Jewish tradition, which he had abandoned, although of course he grew up within this uh, uh, culture and was very much grew up with his uh, uh, Jewish text. Here it is not only Nietzsche, of course, but also Russian figures such as the theologian and poet Vladimir Soloveyov, which Neta uh, mentions and discusses, but also Jewish philosophers such as Lev Shestor, and perhaps above all, Hillel Zeitlin, who was the mentor to many modern Hebrew, uh, modernist Hebrew writers, and perhaps uh, Brenner above all. Um, so in this period, many of these writers were preoccupied with what another uh, uh, important figure in this period, Rod Rudolf Otto called the nominus, the sense of mystery and search for new religiosity and divinity, which is completely outside organized religion. And also in many cases outside Judaism into Christianity. And of course here Netta insistence and her a, a deep knowledge of the cent centrality of Christianity is really crucial uh, uh, where um, she shows it with Brenner and Shlonsky, but I would argue that all Hebrew writers of, uh, uh, of the early 20th century were preoccupied with the figure of Jesus and with Christian themes, which they combined uh, sometimes in very radical uh, mother, uh, manner with Hasidic, uh, mystical, and rabbinic uh, language and, uh, and, and motif. So since I'm, I'm almost out of time, I want to end um, with just two uh, short texts. Well, not really text, two uh, quotes. One of them is from someone who is not uh, discussed in, in Netta book. And this is Gershon Schofman who actually, if you, if you look at his writing, you wouldn't find many references to, to God, but actually uh, uh, there is a, there's, there's a real preoccupation with the question of religiosity. And Schoffman was quoted as someone who actually when he immigrated uh, after the war in 1905, when he was about to be drafted into the Russian army, he uh, escaped to Vienna he used to sit in one of the gardens of Vienna and read the Bible. And somebody would ask him, what are you doing reading the Bible? Are you, are you uh, looking for some text to inspire your stories? And he said, no, I'm doing the opposite. I'm reading the Bible to make sure that my stories are free of melitza, right? So this is kind of one on one hand to show how difficult it was for writers writing in Hebrew to move away from this overly religious language, right? And at the same time, uh, how he was really trying with the, the, the move to Christianity and with the, the really thinking about what is the place of the divine as Netta writes and of uh, mysticism and re religiosity, even in text where there's no intertext to the Bible or to rabbinic literature uh, at all. And um, the other text that I wanted just to quote a few sentences, uh, although I'll do it just in English translation because we don't have time to read the beautiful Hebrew, is from, uh, uh, from Yosef Chaim Brenner, Mr. Uh, Vivle Nekuda, around the poet with Netta reads uh, very quickly but very uh, 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 beautifully. This is a, a, a novel uh, that deals with a character, Yaakov Abramson, uh, who is, um, you know, who grew up in, 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 uh, in, in, in the yeshiva, but we don't see any of that when we actually look at him um, arriving in, in the city of, of Goma, right? And he's really preoccupied with socialism and with Zionism and with uh, his sexual uh, problems. And then we have, so, so there's nothing on the face of it that is about the divine or about religion, but as Netta says, uh, shows in, in the book, in Yaakov Abramson himself, we see a theomorphic move. We see, we see many divine qualities in the character himself. And there is a very uh, beautiful 
a scene right in the middle of the novel where it's, it's so mundane that it doesn't seem like it's anything, has anything to do with the divine, where he goes on the bridge, he sees a woman who is probably a prostitute, and then he's thinking about committing suicide. And then when he sees her, he gives us some money, and then he decides not to kill himself. And Brenner writes about this scene, Uriel to his right, Mephistopheles to his left, Lucifer in front, the divine presence behind, and above his head, three dots. He stationed himself on the bridge and gazed at the water, darkness. Above his head, headless escape, ex expand, and in his heart, the warmth of Jacob. The warmth of Jacob and endless ex escape, there's no end, but the end, the end has come. Black was the sky above him, and black was the water below. And I, I'll end here, but I think you can just, you can, I hope you can just hear in this how there is this very uh, paradoxical move which Netta discusses that on, on one hand, this uh, novel, this scene itself and the novel itself seems like it's really a kind of Dostoevskian uh, 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 move of talking about committing suicide and real uh, despair and the sexual problems and the ide ideological problem and yet, because of the language, which both uh, moves to Christian themes, but also with deep intertextual uh, dialogue with Jewish tradition from the Bible all the way to Hasidism, uh, uh, the, the divine, the dialogue with, div with the divine and with rel religiosity is present in Brenner. So I will end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shahar, for uh, your talk and for reminding us that the, uh, the geography of Hebrew literature, unfortunately, appears in today's news again as a site of, of, of violence. I will moving, I'll move uh, uh, the baton to our next speaker, Dr. Lilach Lachman who is a critic, an editor, a scholar of poetry, uh, who teaches at, uh, in regular days at the Department of Hebrew and Comparative Literature uh, in Haifa University. But at present, uh, she is the Israel Institute Fellow and a visiting scholar at the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies in Boston. She published many articles on romantic and postmodernist uh, poetry with emphasis on poetic historiographies. She is the editor of collections of uh, essay, a collection of essays, excuse me, on Avot Yeshurun's work, and has recently edited two poetry collections of the poet uh, Nurit Zalchi, um, and co-edited a book of essays on Zalchi's work, Gamma. And a book of Lilach's essay is forthcoming uh, soon with uh, Mossad uh, Bialik. Um, so uh, Lilach, the floor is yours. And thank you, everyone who came to Arit. Can you hear me? I would like to begin with a personal note. Engaging with Netta Stahl's The Divine in Modern Hebrew Literature this week, while the terrible images from Kiev haven't stopped assaulting our attention, I found myself rethinking the relevance and tensions of the historical representations of God that Stahl's new book explores. It is difficult to determine which of the striking images of divinity that she tangibly animates could incorporate the appalling, heart-rendering aspect of the present humanitarian crisis. The Alec assuming the voice of the bankrupt biblical God, Lekum Lech Lechayel Ira Arega, in his famous 1903 poem in the city of slaughter, written as response to the pogrom in Kishinev, or Uritz Greenberg's God who needs to be rescued from the great debris, or perhaps Yona Volach's radical revelation of God's absence, Leolam lo ishma et kolo hamatok shel Elohim, Leolam lo yavor od kolo tachat chaloni, טיפות גדולות ירדו במרחבים, אות אין האלוהים בא עוד בחלוני. In fact, all of these contradictory 
and powerful representations of divinity, each as much as the other, as well as the no less piercing images and speech acts of God that Stahl analyzes in her book, encapsulate the entire history that this important book explores. What we make of Stahl's history of God is a major question that came up in the different uh, perspectives of the speakers before me. I won't go into it. What is in fact the history that her book recounts? Uh, I don't know, is it, is it a history about a, a counter history of the thesis of secularizing Hebrew literature? Is it a book about the changing role of pantheism in Hebrew poetry uh, or other things? What is in fact the history? Uh, th this, is, this is a question I want resolved. Although Stahl's narrative partially joins other scholars uh, from uh, Dov Sadan and uh, to Sidra Haizachi and others, part, part, part of them are here and part have been mentioned. Uh, scholars that question clear distinctions between Israeli and Jewish past and present, Stahl differentiates herself from each of them in her perspective, in her mappings, in her questions and in her method. A major issue is the give and take that the book explores between the thesis of secularization that dominates the history of Hebrew modernism and the actual reclaiming of Jewish traditions and languages in its poetic text, especially those that have been excluded in the canon and by the canon. Due to time restrictions in what follows, I will telegraphically address myself to three aspects uh, of Neta's book, all pertaining to the particularity of her historiographical inquiry. First, the temporality of God's story. Second, its poetic aspect. And third, its gendered as accent. First, in contrast to certain atemporal understandings of the monotheistic God that emphasize its, etern its eternal infinity, Neta explores the dramatic changes in the multiple faces and locations of God is wandering within Hebrew modernity and it is very tangible from the rotten um, um, learning study in Bialik um, through um, uh, his exact, the opening of the window in this study to the field in the Galut and then to the fields of Israel um, and uh, God embodied as, as flesh, um, as, as really flesh and body in, in, in Shlonsky and partially in Oitzvi Greenberg and so and so till we, we get into uh, Emek Hashidim and the pulpil of the eye in, in Chaviva's um, dual metaphysical and literal uh, poem that we will come back to. So uh, actually uh, all these uh, representations uh, from Bialik and Hameiri through Greenberg and Shlonsky to Yona Volach, Chaviv Abdaya and Behar are subject to historical circumstances as uh, Neta contends. But not only that, their cumulative effect in itself potentially consists of an altogether new history of modern Hebrew literature and culture. Uh, the second, Second, even though Stahl accounts for diverse theological and social cultural tensions as a context for her story of God in modernism, her historiography is distinctively poetic, not because she focused predominantly on poetry, but also in the assumptions and the directions of her quest, both of which exceed the religious secular binary. Stahl's narrative takes 
after Gershon Scholem, who highlighted the poet's role in shaping Hebrew, and Shachar talked about that. In fact, Scholem's question as to what the value of language would be if God has withdrawn hover, hovers over Stahl's entire quest, quote, the might of the language bound up in the name, Scholem, is a thread that accompanies all her readings. More specifically, Stahl's analysis of the theological context determines her own historiographical poetics. Lingering on Isaiah uh, 4018 that Sidra already mentioned, to whom then will you liken God and what likeness will you compare unto him? She emphasizes the how in regard to new perceptions of the divine rather than focusing on the search, on the search itself and on its theological strictures and solutions as philosophers and scholars as diverse uh, as uh, Maimonides, Rosenzweig, Kaufmann, and Loboboim have done, Stahl examines the literary and primarily the poetic modes in the representation of God. Through an anatomy of fragmented pictures, she explores both uh, the time of poetry and some of the spatial manifestations in the movement, within the movements of God's exile. The poetic accordingly allows her to go beyond categories of secular and religion. My third and last point concerns the transition in the representation of divinity in modern Hebrew poetry that Stahl locates in the 1970s, a shift from what she describes as metaphorical figurations of God in Amitai and Rabikovich to metaphysical representations in Valach, in Valach Yeshurun, Chedvar Echavi, Chaviva Pdaya, Shvas Elhuv, and Shimon Adas. Uh, the, the, ju the juncture that is located at the 70s, Stahl, in this juncture, Stahl uncovers the seeds of what will become toward the 90s and the first decades of the 21st century, a new way of perceiving and representing the divine. Her argument culminates in a powerful reading of Chaviv Abdayat's first three poetry collections in context of her uh, theoretical and scholarly thinking um, on, the, on the questions uh, which in which he discussed and Almog Bahar's uh, novel. Stahl detects a strong connection between this writer's ethnic heritage as the Faradic Jews and their reclaiming of traditional Judaism. Importantly, in her view, the fact that they deal with traditional Judaism as centered around non-Ashkenazic texts and tradition and traditions may have contributed to their reintroduction of pantheism into the contemporary Israeli scene. To this mapping, one could probably add Zelda and perhaps an entire tradition of Eastern European trinot and uh, bodily female voices and traditions from East and West that are invo invoked by some of the poets I mentioned, and uh, of course that um, Netta mentions and discusses. I emphasize this point because I view the Stahl's forceful reading of Chaviva Daya as the tool, the force of her entire history. And it's not because she brings it to the present and Chaviva sits here, but because I think it stretches the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest bow, the biggest spectrum to ancient liturgical and mystical traditions uh, and forms and poetic forms of speech. Um, and actually by, by um, in one of her uh, beautiful analysis 
of Daya, a meta shows how Chaviva borrows God's voice uh, who, who addresses her in the feminine second person. And actually the poem invokes the silence, the, the, the unarticulated and unspoken space that is really dynamized and becomes infinite, but at the same time, closer and closer between the, the, the praying subject who has no words to pray and God who is invoked speaking to her. So uh, in, in such analysis, um, Neta shows really how Daya introduces into Hebrew a new music that our ears are not used to capture, but it's new and ancient at the same time. And how, uh, in fact, she reshapes and writes anew and innovates forms of intimacy between God and his feminine aspects, God and the feminine subject. In this manner, I think, Pedaya poetics and Nedashtal study both signal a genealogy that requires a rereading of the traditional gendered roles of an entire mystical tradition, maybe mystical and prophetic tradition, because a lot of the uh, uh, figures that are discussed in the, in the first part of the book are male, are very, very uh, distinctively male figures. And there is a, really a kind of imbalance, but unsettling new balance between the epilogue and uh, the rest of the book in my reading. And I would like to conclude uh, by reading a very, very brief translation that is quoted and beautifully analyzed in the book of one of Chaviva's poems from Miteva Suma. When again, I don't know if you wish to look at me or all that you wished was that I would look at you, maybe because you longed for a little providence, you forgot that I, as in hiding face, my face to the other end indeed, I am in hiding, God. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lilach, for uh, this uh, wonderful talk and, uh, and our, as we say, uh, so the pun, I, I, I'm sure, Chaviva, you already heard that pun uh, several times. So our last presenter is Chaviva Pedaya herself. Uh, so Chaviva is a poet, an author. So she's also a researcher of, uh, in Jewish studies. She serves as the head of the Eliashar Center for the study of Jewish Sephardic heritage at the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. And she's also chairing the Committee for the Advancement of the Humanities um, um, at the Council of Higher Education in Israel. Um, and her new book of poems entitled India is about to be published uh, uh, these days. Uh, so uh, Haviva, uh, the floor um, is yours. Toda, 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 Meta, Arie, Shahar, Sidra, Velilach. Um, I'm very excited to participate in this evening with you. I will start by saying that Neta's book has taken me by surprise. It's very difficult for a poet to speak about articles and studies written about her. Obviously, a poet cannot speak about this subject from the detached position of a researcher. I consider my role here as responding and referring to what has been reflected about myself, my psychological and social self, by the discussion proposed by Neta. 
I will try to reflect back the way I seem reflected to myself through her work. Among the few and special pieces written about or around my poetry is Salhouf's wonderful article that explored the link between poetics and mysticism. And in my work, Liti Shun, who, who bewitched me in her interview with me, leading me to a state of poetic uh, confession. Uh, Shaul Setter wrote about the diasporic voice and was quoted by Stahl in her book. Aubrey Glazer, who surprised me by associating my poetry with shamanism, relaying on my great grandfathers, Rabbi Udaftaya, discoursing with spirits in his book, Minhat Yehuda, his attempt to atone for Natan of Gaza and Shabtai Tzvi. Now, the thing that most surprised me about Neta Stahl's book was the definition of the experience of divinity as pantheistic. I have never given myself any account of what my own conception of divinity is, aside from my fundamental experience of its immediate presence and occasional absence. I, to hear about my poems through the category of pantheism, while most of my life I'm researching Hasidism through this category, it was really surprising. Stahl presented the pantheistic current in Hebrew poetry and dated it into the early 20th century against the background of trends in 19th century Europe. You all talked about it. Then moved to discuss my own and also Armog Bahar poetry. I think it leads us from another point of view, and she really put it very beautiful, to see the affinities between Hasidism in Eastern Europe and the state of the Sephardi Mizrahi Jewish in Israel today. I would suggest that I think both myself and Almog are not situated on this. Uh, yes, I agree that uh, I agree with Neta, and I think that both myself and Almog are not situated on this European continuum. And I think that here a more we have to look for this natural place. Uh, in the continuity with the conception of divinity in the East. Maybe we, sh we should add here Amira Hess uh, as well. So yeah, I was a little confused. So um, this place of the uh, greater culture of Hebrew literature, patheism is also found as a continuation of the Kabbalists the shamans and the spiritual leaders from Baghdad or North Africa. I was thrilled to find um, that I was quoted in Neta book in my poem, This choice threw me back to the powerful experience of the divine presence within the urban neglect in Beersheba of that time not a revelation in the forest, but in the city, and not a revelation in the white city, but in the abandoned city. According uh, to Stahl, the result is a sort of negative theology in which the existence of God and the totality of his presence are referenced only through the objects that the poem points at. She takes my observation uh, regarding the Zohar and ecstatic Kabbalah literature as presented in my book, Vision and Speech, as different types of ecstasy, the description of the images and objects surrounding God while not really touching his own being, his own body. In that sense, I am presented in a way that's a bit hard for me to digest. 
Another observation of Stahl is that the poetic voice in the poetry book, my poetry book, Metavas Duma, from a sealed ark, is often the naked soul. At times, she says, speaking to herself, to the body in that she is enclosed in, to a lover or to God. However, and I quote, she says, the closer we get to the end of the book, a clearer picture of God emerges when the reflection of God <clears throat> in, in visions of darkness, mud, and the gray sky turns into a reflection that is drawn in lighter and dimmer colors. This really touched me deeply. The transition to darkness is related to what is called in Hebrew, it pashtut gashmiyut, the expansion of our corporality, or in my words, in my poem, gashmuti apshuta. She quotes from this poem, According to Stahl, in these poems, in part of them, the poetics approaches silence, sleep, almost non-being. She borrowed my explanation for Atsilut, emanation in the Kabbalah, and she says, and I was really surprised by that, the justice divinity as a kind of fragmentation is an event whereby it reveals itself and something of it always stays behind as a kind of non-verbalized redundancy. So my poetry is characterized by a trend of contraction, tzimtzum, and softening, haklasha. It is hard for me to voice an opinion on this matter. The experience that is characterized as pantheism has many colors in Jewish mysticism. And one of them, which I would like to reflect now, uh, now about it, and one of them is also the possibility of placing the vessels as empty, empty vessels from which the spirit breaks. Manin tvirin in Aramic uh, language. Manin tvirin kilim shvurim. For the mystics living in the spaces between ecstasy, between the revelation of the spirit, between this experience of being a tool for the divinity, this abandonment is frightening, as if in poetry, as if a kind of pregnancy lasts without birth. Perhaps the fragments of Mizrahi and Sephardic Jew in Hebrew literature also receives a new face from this discussion and from the definition of pantheism and the transition towards manin tvirin, tools from which the wind has departed. And how one can produce a sound without wind, without air, without spirit. Perhaps writing enlightens you more deeply about something within yourself as a reader. Perhaps my poetic and mystical tendency towards an entity of darkness explains why, as, why I was attracted to read Nachmanides in the first place. Nachmanides, whose divinity, whose divine infinity is depicted in symbols of darkness, of nothingness. On the one hand, his darkness is weakness, contraction. And on the other hand, it is the glow of light which is full of more than the heart can contemplate or verbalize. Male yoter mi mashalev yechol yeharher. Perhaps my thought of darkness is this kind lit by glows and colors, something which does not stand definitively between nullity and existence, closer in the general culture to the text of Dionysius and in Hebrew to the dark light, ha'or anashach, of the Zohar. So thank you for the light you have shed on my poetry of darkness and the shadow of death. In this terrible moments of human experience in which a single individual or a people become totally empty like a balloon of any presence of spirit and are torn and go to oblivion. 
just as we suffer a personal catastrophe and now the catastrophe of Ukraine. Thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, Haviva, for this very touching uh, um, commentary. So we have uh, uh, roughly 10 minutes for, uh, for discussion, pardon me. Um, so I am um, opening the, the floor for, uh, for comments, uh, uh, questions um, um, to, uh, to all speakers, to all panelists. Um, um, so please feel free to, to uh, unmute yourself um, and ask a question. Um, And the panelists are, of course, welcome to, to cross uh, a comment as well. I'll ask a question. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not able to have my video on. My internet is a little unstable. It's Barbara Mann. Hi, Netta. Hi, thank you, everyone. Uh, such a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon um, hearing all of you. And um, I'm looking forward to reading the book. I'm wondering, uh, just because I know that sometimes there's like a little bit of a gap between the finishing of the book and the publication. And I know the pandemic kind of slowed things down. This is a topic that you've been working on, really going back to Uri Tzvi and some, you know, so that's a uh, really beautiful ways. And so I just wondered if you had any, any thoughts about, you know, how your thinking about this topic has evolved over the years, kind of like a, a meta comment on this question, which of course is, you know, has been so central for so many scholars. And I think, you know, I'm just thanking you for your really unique and comprehensive contribution to it. But if you could maybe just, you know, offer a few sort of meta, meta words about it all, I would love to hear that. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Dava. Yeah, I appreciate the question. It's actually, the book was uh, published in two, two, uh, 2020, but uh, the first thing that I heard from the press when they told me that it's out is that it won't be out in the kind of like or in the full sense of the word uh, for many months, because it was really at the fight of the pandemic. Uh, so indeed, it's kind of like a real delay in that respect. I feel that it's not really, uh, when when people say it's a new book, I feel that it's really, for me, it's really, uh, <laughs> I, I like Shachar said about like 10 years before, when I, I feel a little bit like that now, and kind of like came back to it for the occasion of, uh, of this event. Uh, but the question for you mentioned uh, Atzag, and I wrote on Atzag both on my uh, in my book on the on Jesus uh, in Hebrew literature, and both and, uh, and and I also dedicated a chapter to Atzag in um, in this book. And I think one thing that is really unique to Atzag, and maybe uh, I I can't really feel. I'm not sure that there is anyone else that there is. Um, such a, a lifelong dialogue with uh in one hand, one hand with, with Jesus and on a, the other hand with um with the with, with the Jewish God. And there is a, in, in the book I try to show that there is a certain point that there, there are similarities uh that he creates intentionally uh, as part of his uh, anti-theodicy, as part of his lamentation on, uh, on uh, a, an accusation against God for his um, esterpanim uh, during the Churban, during, uh, and th this is in Rehovot Anar. So he kind of like, uh, in, early on, in, even in, the, in his Yiddish um, poetry, uh, you, you, there is really kind of like similarities that I don't think that he's even aware of, well, in his later poetry, he, he, um, he really uh, uses uh, his, um, the way he talks about Jesus to say to God, if you are no longer our God, if, if you are like this, uh, uh, the God that really hears the prayers of the Gentiles and the murderers and 
ignores our own prayers. So you you will be Jesus for us. Um, so I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if it answered the, your entire question, but I, since you mentioned the tag, and I think it's really in the case of a tag, really the two books kind of like merged in a sense into one in the, at least in the second part of the chapter on, on, uh, on a tag and God in this book. So thank you. Yes, please, Sidra, I, I see your, your hand is up. Yeah, um, well, this has been such a rich conversation and there's so much more, but I just, I wanna comment actually on two things that are sort of um, atmospheric. And that is that uh, Barbara and I are the only two people who have spoken so far with American accents. Um, the book is written in English, but it's written about writers who all write in other languages. And I'd like you to, um, to just sort of comment on that, Netta, perhaps because you're living in the United States, uh, teaching presumably in, mostly in, in English, writing in English about subjects that are, um, that are Hebrew uh, and maybe other few other languages. Um, the, other, the other thing that occurs to me is, um, and, and I, feel it, I feel it all the time living in, in, in Jerusalem, um, you know, when, when Atzag writes in front of the Tselem or, or all of the relation, all of the various ways in which Jesus has come into the poetry of Leah Goldberg, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these were all people who lived in, in, in societies in which there was um, a dominant Christian uh, culture. Um, unfortunately, Israelis have grown up, several generations now of Israelis have grown up without having any sense of any other. Unfortunately, um, the Arab other is almost invisible. And certainly the, rela the, the uh, uh, religion of the Arab other is invisible, not to speak of the Christian other. And I wonder if you could, and, and so what seems to be happening and you're, and you're, you're referencing it in, in, in the wonderful work on Habiba's book, on Habiba's work and also on Amog's work is somehow there's an aversion to other to the cultures of origin of one's origin or to other centuries but the present is is so monolithic and monocultural and i i don't know if we have time to expand on that but i'd like you to think about that yeah thank you sidra so i, I you I, I think you're right about uh, putting the the finger on like what you call an atmosphere for me it's kind of like an existential um let's say i, I really I, my the line that is always stuck is stuck with me is but i used actually in my um acknowledgement for my, for the first book about like um yeshurun avot yeshurun's uh uh words of sod torata gaguim <laughs> And the Sod Torah Tagaguim, the secret of the longing, the Torah of longing, and even the, the idea that I need to even that try, um, I'm, I'm translating it, uh, thinking about what is the translation mean. It's in one hand a work, always a work in progress. I think for those of us like uh, you and Shachar, of course, uh, uh, the teach, um, he, uh, here, uh, I mean, out of Israel and with, in a language that is not uh, Hebrew, but teach uh, on Hebrew or Yiddish in the case of, of Shachar language, that awareness to that sword <laughs> is always there uh, and to the gaguim, to that longing and, and that gap between, uh, uh, I mean, and we can think about it, of course, in like what, or like you mentioned Gershom Shol and, and of course uh, when um, Hamutal was here, she was talking about, uh, about Bialik's, uh, um, I mean, that, that awareness to the language itself, the, the Hebrew, I think it comes even more so when you work in a translation and you always are aware of, the, of which is the right word to, to choose. I will leave. I mean, I'm, I'm, I thank you for the comment. I, I agree, uh, but I think it's it's something for all of us to think about because that's it's one of the things that um, I mean we all I think um, lament in a sense about the Israeli society. 
I think we have time for one last question and I will give that uh, uh, to Abigail uh, Gilman that, that raised her hand. So Abigail, please. Uh, Thank you. Um, so I, Neta, I can't wait to read the book. Um, as someone who is deeply involved in religion and literature, literature and religion as a field, I, I can't wait to read it. Um, and I'm gonna ask you a personal question which much must be asked. How do your ideas about God your theology affect your treatment of this material? Um, because, and, and a little bit of background to my question quickly is just that, you know, we heard a whole spectrum, as kind of a spectrum of different theological positions, pantheism, Kabbalah, Hasidut. These are very important. I mean, people live and die by these definitions of, you know, um, norms about God, Jewish God, Christian. Um, and then no God, the Odyssey. I mean, these are, there's a lot at stake in these very distinct theologies. Um, and we heard, you know, for even today, people praying to God for, to help us versus the idea, you know, the other end that God is a literary character. And then, you know, so there's, you know, um, and, um, you know, my father was a theologian and, uh, he liked to say, you know, if anyone asks you, I, I learned something important from him. He said, if anyone asks you if you believe in God, the first thing you must say is, what do you mean by God? What is the God that you're asking me if I believe in? So I put the question to you. <laughs> uh, so, so this is, I think, why I went to become, I, I, I chose to be a scholar and not a poet. <laughs> I can't really, I don't, I, I kind of like, I, I'm not sure that um, I like the distance from what I feel. And even when uh, Riva said, uh, I mean, I, I really am one of these people that always um, was hesitating to go to a poet or, or a writer that I work on an interview or ask question or show that my book to. And, uh, and Lilach can attest that I was very uh, anxious about Haviva reading my uh, interpretation of her because I feel that that kind of like this distance and uh, it, 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 it's so hard to not keep the distance. And I think for also from that question of uh, my own um, understanding of God, I feel like it's almost, um, has to be out of the picture because that's I, I'm working on on the text of others. Uh, um, I would just say that as I grew up uh, and was raised in a for in a very Yeke fa family with uh, in in a kibbutz, a very secular kibbutz. So that uh, I all. And on the other hand, um, for more than 20 years, I live with a partner who, is, uh, who grew up in a very religious um, community and keeps uh, and still uh, observe mitzvot. So my life, my life and my kind of like theological and thoughts about uh, the divine have been um, very, <laughs> let's say, um, complicated in a sense, but also um, almost across the whole spectrum that one can imagine within at least the Israeli, um, um, yeah, within, within the Israeli spectrum. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I hope this answers, I mean. The w wonderful uh, concluding words, actually. I mean, I think we um, um, w we live in such a, a dark time, but uh, your book is not only coming to light, but also bringing some light in this these days of, of darkness. So um, um, please uh, join me in um, uh, thanking uh, first and foremost Neta for producing uh, such a a fabulous book, uh, which is kind of a, a source for such a rich conversation, and to our wonderful uh, panelists that that allowed us to have this wonderful symposium, uh, Sidra, Shachar, Lilach, eh, Haviva, um, and and thank you all, and 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 take good care. <laughs>